circle the planet Low orbit, terrestrial transmitter on, I record it Solar power on the panel, absorb it Sun shines brighter as I move right toward it See the mothership off in the distance And another ship leaving the instance I don't wanna be the guy with the Winstons I gotta be the guy with the missions Shuttle slows to a crawl Behemoth of a ship like three miles tall Twenty miles wide, wonder what the fuck's inside What kind of science make the ship ride Dock in the bay, the clamps engage Gravity generator enable no floating away Take on my seatbelt and exit the mini crab Time to pilot the battleship to any path These are the voyages of our ship Fly through space on an astro trip Got a backward tucked in my lips And a handful of knob all up in my fist Ahoy there, fellow travelers of the digital realm. Aloha! Aloha is the word that embodies the spirit of welcoming, love, and unity. It is our compass today as we embark on a journey through this enchanting world with Dr. Lisa Thompson. So grab your virtual A's, kick back, and let those Aloha vibes wash over you like you're in the tube at Pipeline. Once again, this is George with the G, a.k.a. the legend of Honolulu himself. The man, the myth, the legend. And I will pass it off to our awesome co-hosts. Boom, you have the floor. Hey there, beautiful souls. It's your girl, Allie. And once again, we're back at it. Super stoked for this conversation we're about to have. I don't know if you guys could tell, but my cheeks are hurting from cheesing because I'm just like <laughs> literally ready to jump right into this. So without further ado, say hello. Hello, everybody. It's Justin with Living Life Consciously. I'm glad to be here as always. And up here in the corner, we have our lovely esteemed guest, Dr. Lisa Thompson. Would you like to say hi before I introduce you to the audience? Aloha, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here with us. All right. So if, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with Dr. Lisa, she is a best-selling author, speaker, galactic ambassador and channeler, an intuitive transformational coach who supports and empowers people to intentionally design their best life by living from their yes so they can embrace self-love, trust their intuition, and gracefully move forward through their fears to take inspired action to live a life they love. All about that. She is an evolutionary biologist who understands the embodiment of ancient DNA within humans and guides them into the intergalactic realm. She has two different websites that I would like to plug for her. The first one is mysticmanta.com. I'll put a little display down here for that. The next one we're going to be talking about is Big Island UFO Tours. Da -da 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 -da. Oops, sorry, I just hit you in your no, face. Um, and you can also catch her on YouTube with her channel called uh, Connection to the Cosmos with Dr. Lisa Thompson. So All happy. right. All right. We're very honored to have you, Dr. Lisa, and um, if you could briefly share with the audience uh, what your, I guess, uh, motivations were in starting your own practice to help experiencers uh, realize their potential and kind of uh, reflect on what it is that they may be uh, contacting with uh, in relation to the phenomena. Yeah, so I actually have been an experiencer my entire life with UFOs and extraterrestrials, including... Lucky! <laughs> I've been on spacecraft, and now I work with 13 different galactic races that I channel their wisdom, their energy. And so it's been a really interesting ride. I'm 50 years old, and my first conscious memory of being taken into a craft was when I was 15. And wow, that's so young. Yeah. Well, and I had been with them many times throughout my childhood, but I didn't mm. get to. So it wasn't until I became mature enough where I wouldn't freak out about the experience. And I was able to have it validated as well by a very high mm government official, former government official, that knew about the different ET races that our government knows about and works with. And so having that experience in my teens um, really planted the seed for the work I do now as a galactic ambassador and channeler. 
And my first um, healing modality that I got trained in was actually past life regression therapy. Mm -hmm. And so I started working with clients and, you know, a lot of my clients were coming to me and having non earth life. They were, you know, experiencing lives in other realms, other worlds. And some of them had missing time experiences and other things where regression is an amazing way to get those memories back and have people understand it from the higher perspective. And so really my mission and everything that I do now is to change the fear-based narrative of the government, media, and Hollywood. Amen. Thank you so much for making that a prominent thought factor in everything that you do, because I mean, there's so much fear everywhere. I love that you want to embrace spreading a message of love and unity rather than the opposing fear, you know, narrative that seems to have many, many people under mm -hmm. a spell. It does. And, you know, fear makes money. Fear sells. Fear and sells. That's exactly. right. Yeah. And so, you know, for me, this is really a passion that I have. I know it's like my mission for the next half of my life that I'm on. And mm -hmm. when I when I share the information that I have with people and explain you know, these higher dimensional beings and some of the some of the extraterrestrials are in a third, fourth dimensional polarized reality like we are experiencing here on Earth. But that is just a tiny fraction of the others that are out there that are really, you know, part of our galactic family. Mm. Mm. Now I'm, I'm curious about, um, you said that you are a galactic ambassador, right? Yes. Okay. Do you want to ask our question? Go right ahead. <laughs> um, yeah. How does one become a galactic ambassador mm -hmm. and what does it feel like to be one? Yeah. Please share with us. Okay. Well, so it, it's, a title that um, I guess you could also call it a galactic shaman because really mm, okay. the ambassador is a bridge, right? They yeah. are trying okay. to help um, mediate information communication, <laughs> and really introduce people to each other. So whether it's an ambassador for a government or it's a galactic ambassador, it's the same kind of thing. So really, I'm here to bridge this information from those higher dimensional realms to Earth humans so that, you know, hopefully maybe 10, 20 years down the road when we are actually having massive open contact that people will really yeah. manifest it, manifest it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll really appreciate and understand because, mm. I mean, Again, here on Earth, we have so much polarization. We have so much judgment of people. <laughs> and so we need to start working on getting over that judgment, seeing things yeah. from perspective so that we can embrace the diversity that is out there. Interesting. Yes. Interesting you mentioned that. I'd, I'd like to ask you, Dr. Lisa, how might the possibility of contact with uh, aliens or NHI influence human psychology? Uh, including beliefs and, and worldviews. You know, um, as an experiencer myself, uh, along with Allie and Justin, you know, we're kind of, you know, I hate to use this term, kind of ahead of the, the curve in relation <laughs> to accepting the, the reality of the phenomena. But for the generally uninformed masses, the populace, how might you think this would potentially affect their already pre-existing um, uh, belief systems? Great question. It is a great question. And um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Ah, uh, yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to be easy to have people maybe embrace this. But because now finally the government has admitted that this phenomenon is real, even the skeptical people are starting to change their minds and be like, oh, OK, what is it? But then people then have that fear of like, well, they're going to take over. Or they're, you know, they're going to destroy Earth. And the thing is, yeah. they wanted to do that, they could have already done that way before we developed nuclear weapons or anything like that. Right. Um, now, in terms of religious paradigms, though, for some That's people, a heavy one. It can shatter their world. Um, and so it's really about all of us and others like us to just keep spreading the message. Mm -hmm. that, that's why we're doing this. <laughs> I do everything I do with the tours, my, my classes, my books, my podcasts, because 
the more information that people have and they can understand that these beings really are related to us. And even in the Bible, um, you know, there are ET visitors, right? It's yeah. And in the Hindu scripts, in, in all of the, you know, the religions around the world, the information is there that they exist. And so mm -hmm. it's changing that perspective. Yeah. Yeah, I think changing the perspective is going to be easy for some people and then really, really hard for others. For me, I think it's going to be like, I think the determining factor is going to be how hard they're holding on to their like religious paradigms or their the programming that they were brought up with, because the, the tighter you hold on to the walls of the box you put yeah. yourself in, the harder it's going to be to let this kind of reality sink in and integrate. Yes. Well, mm -hmm. one of the things that I do want to bring up that um, I, I actually had learned in my earlier childhood um, in I attended a spiritual school of enlightenment starting at age 13 with my mom and my- <laughs> That is so awesome. Oh my gosh. <laughs> with learning things about parallel lives and, you know, all timelines existing simultaneously mm -hmm. in the quantum realm. So one of the things that, you know, one of the groups I channel are the Arcturians and they are constantly reminding me and my clients that you get to choose what timeline you want to be a part of. Because even though we're all existing here on Earth, that doesn't mean that we're experiencing the same thing. Right. right. Whatever you want to focus on is going to be what you're experiencing in your environment, your reality. So you and your neighbor could be having totally different experiences. Mm -hmm. I feel being here, I'm on the big island of Hawaii, and I'm in this joyful, peaceful bubble of the world because I am daily like living through my joy, following yeah. my passions. And that keeps that vibration really high. And so for people who are live, choosing to live in that kind of state rather than listening to the news and fall, you know, really being pulled yeah. war and politics. Yeah. Then my reality is I'm on a different timeline potentially. And, you know, that brings up something that I've been thinking about, because as you mentioned the news, I thought to myself, like, man, I keep telling my mom and dad, turn that noise off. Like, yeah. stop letting it feed <laughs> your brain with the way they want you to think. Just turn the noise off. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it makes me want to ask you, because you mentioned that you grew up in a metaphysical esoteric type of household right which is a stark contrast to how i grew up because i grew up as a roman catholic so for me it was all about the ten commandments going to religion school yeah. getting baptized making communion making confirmation follow the rules follow the rules follow the rules so i'm just wondering um how do you think that like growing up with knowing all of this as a reality benefited you compared to somebody like me who didn't find it out till like I was in my 30s you know what I mean right <laughs> well I mean like one thing I know I did you know before I was born into this earth life I chose my mother specifically knowing that that was the path that I was soul be contracts yeah. and <laughs> I, I didn't I've had more non-earth lives than earth lives and mm. I really did came, come here to be like a change maker for the world and you know really this ambassador kind of role it took years for me to feel comfortable to step into it but yeah. what i what i have been able to do so again i'm 50 but in those 50 years i'm in my fourth career mm. in my third marriage so i've lived multiple lives in this one life in this 150 years right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I was following the path. I was following the passions. And even though there were moments where I got stuck in my humanness, I was always embracing stepping out into the unknown and creating my reality. And so, you know, a lot of people, they, they get stuck in what they know because it's comfortable, even if it's the most horrible, abusive situation they don't feel like they have an out or, or they have that fear of the unknown. And so for me, I've been able to learn many very hard lessons in this life. And I know as a human, there will be more to come, but it's given me um, 
I guess, a knowingness that I really, like, again, quantum mechanics tells us we create our reality. Yeah. Thoughts become things, right? Where attention goes, energy flows. Yes, exactly. And so I've been able to create some really amazing things in this life because of that. That's amazing. Um, I'm, I'm really distracted and uh, like encaptured by your necklace. And you mentioned that you had previous <laughs> careers before what you're doing now. And one of them was a jewelry maker. Did you by any chance make that one? No, I got this one. Oh, off. okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> speaking really speaking like of it. your nice. necklace, I mean, the, the gray that you have in the background, does he have a name? Well, actually, that's an Arcturian. Oh, an Arcturian. That's yeah, they're blue, correct? Yeah, oh. and that Uluru, and Uluru is the first Arcturian that I actually met five years ago. Is that and who you oh, wow. channel? That's one of the groups. Yeah, that's okay. the original one, and they are a collective. But when I when I met them, there was a group of them, but there was one that was to the front that was the spokesperson, and the name that was given to me was Uluru, and so of the last five years you know i've really worked through understanding my relationship with them and actually uluru is an aspect of myself i am uluru because <laughs> okay. we're dimensional so yeah so basically um the channeling that i do is basically channeling myself from these different realms what's it, it like bringing that energy in it's pretty intense actually yeah. mm. It's taken, it's only been a year that I've allowed it to come oh. locally. Um, okay. So I, you know, for, for the first four years, I, I knew who they were. I was working with them to some degree. Um, but then last year when I was writing my book, Connection to the Cosmos, they really wanted to channel through me. And so that came through writing at first. And then I, I opened up my vocal channel. Um, I, I had some fear around the vocal channeling because mm -hmm. that spiritual school that I was a part of was actually a channeled school. Um, it was an ascended master being channeled through this lady, Jay-Z Knight. And there was so much stigma around channeling. And I grew up in a, in a little tiny town, very conservative, very religious. And so it was this us versus them mentality. And I just wanted to be normal and fit in, even though I loved the spiritual information we were learning. Yeah. yeah. I had to get over my own judgments of the channeling thing and not care yeah. what other Now, I wanted to ask you when you receive new clients and, you know, they had an experience that was that was just so impactful and, you know, they they may not necessarily be familiar with the lore or any types of uh, other things that could help contextualize their understanding. So, like, uh, in terms of a thought experiment, if you have a new client that comes from a, a fear-based kind of operant perspective about their experience, how, how might you as a, a practitioner um, in your practice, how, how might you be able to reframe this narrative in your client of say maybe like a, a negative alien abduction or or perhaps a, a not so righteous encounter with uh, extraterrestrial beings and how might your approach sort of influence uh, any types of psychological trauma and what are the coping strategies that you uh, help them to work on and identify okay i love that question so as a regression therapist, um, what's really important is that I act as the guide for the client. And what's really important when doing this work to really understand why that experience happened from the higher perspective, you have to get very deep into the subconscious mind. And some therapists don't go deep enough. And so they, they keep their client in that fear mode. But mm -hmm get to the deeper level where even the higher self can come forward to give information about what the soul contract was because nothing is done against our will ever we choose all these situations and the, i'm going to say the majority i won't say 100 percent, but the majority of the contact experiences the people being taken on the craft experiences is actually something that is not a scary thing at all. Like 
you know, people that are part of the hybrid program with the Zetas, and I'm one of those. Um, I signed up for it. I'm like, yeah, I want to be a part of that. From <laughs> Zeta Reticuli? Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, that's one of the most common of the groups that mm. will take people. People have that fear response. So Betty and Barney Hill, you know, when they're being taken. Classic case. Right. Where they're having that massive fear response because maybe eggs are taken, sperm is taken. They don't understand it. But when people get to that deeper level of like, oh, okay, I signed up for it. And likely maybe in my one of my lives, I, I was the Zeta. So then I volunteered to come here on earth to be the human, to then mm. be part of the program. Mm. And mm. only have things in our lives at the same vibration, the same frequency that we are resonating at. And so people who might experience something as a negative thing, perhaps they have a lot of shadows that they need to still work through in their minds. Shadow work. Yeah. And um. where someone who is vibrating a little higher, you know, again, has worked through some of those darker places in the mind, they're going to have a different experience. But so with the regression, we're able to get information where then they're, they can see that soul agreement. They understand what the whole purpose was, what lesson they needed to learn, you know, why that happened. Mm -hmm. And there, they can, it starts to actually rewire the, the brain and change the physiology and really help with the understanding. So, you know, I'm, I'm glad mm -hmm. you asked that, George, and sorry, forgive me for cutting you That's off, okay. but, um, all three of us mod a Discord server called the UAP Society, which is a community that was derived from the Lato Files YouTube channel run by none other than Chris Lato. And we have all kinds of people coming in from experiencers who are sold, they know their stuff, they don't let anybody talk them out of it. Yeah. And then you have people that are skeptics, you have people that are nuts and bolts, and you have all, like, it's a, it's a 5,000 people, it's a mixed crowd. It's I'll just a plethora. Put it like that of different yeah, kinds of perspectives. <laughs> yeah, yeah right. right. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking of like the people that come in speaking about these, uh, you know, negative abductions. Mm -hmm. And um, my response is always to just throw the idea out there for them, let them have a little thought about it. Um, excuse me, I'm tripping over my words, thought experiment about it, where I just throw out the idea of, well, what if you signed up for this before you incarnated here and it's part of your soul contract and your human ego brain is just not remembering that because you're not supposed to and they get like so upset they're like why would I have signed up for this I didn't ask for this blah 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 I'm like you might not remember you did but you did <laughs> right, exactly well and the same thing um because you know you can think about it people who are sexually abused or you know who have other kinds of physical abuse um, they also signed up for it. And, and because we are more than just this one earth life, we're here to experience all of it. Right. I'm we, glad you brought that up. Yeah, um, I heard you speak about that on a different podcast and the response you got was not so great. So I just want to make it a better experience to where, um, you know, people have a hard time wrapping their heads around the ideas. Like if, if you've been through a bad situation or you've been through abuse or you've experienced a lot of trauma, their response is always like, well, how, why would I have signed up for that, right? And you have to like zoom out. If you think of it just from this meat suit that your soul is encapsulating right now, um, you know, it seems really dark and heavy and you got that duality and that polarity and you got all that heaviness around it. But if you can zoom out and realize that your soul has a higher perspective that it was considering at the time. And if there was a specific type of lesson that you had to learn, and I've learned this through NDEs, don't come for me, I'm not an ex expert or anything, but this is just what I've learned. So from my understanding, there's a certain type of experience that your soul has to go through in order to gain like new understanding. And sometimes those bad situations is that, you know, sometimes you have to go through something bad to uncover something good. And um, I, I just also want to point out the idea of if you can switch your mindset from being the victim to the victor, like instead mm -hmm. of why did this happen to me? What was me? Poor me, poor me and switch it to, okay, what was I supposed to learn from that experience? What was my soul supposed to gain yeah. from growing through that? It's a different, it's a game changer. Would you like it to speak on that? 
Yeah, it's totally a game changer. And I'll speak from a personal experience where my first marriage was highly abusive, mm-hmm. verbal, emotional, physical. And when I finally was able to get out of the relationship and I was only able to get out because I had a baby and okay. I, I cannot let her thinking that this is okay. He and I, we had a business together. So I knew if I oh, that must have been hard. So, yeah, there were a lot of things trapping me in it. And yet I got myself out. Thank goodness for my daughter, because Mm. she was the one who I was able to get out for. My world did crash. The business did fail. I did have to file bankruptcy. And yet I came out on the other side, even more powerful, more like in a beautiful place than I was before, because what I had to really do was reclaim my self-love and, you know, and understand my worthiness because I, you know, I had these cycles of toxic relationships stemming from my childhood of my parents being divorced since I was two and abandonment issues and all that. And, but for me then coming out of that experience, then I could be then a teacher, a guide for other people that are in that situation, knowing Mm. that you're stuck. Even if the worst case scenario happens, which for me it did, I still, I'm here. I survived and I thrived. So I'm like the rising phoenix. That's awesome. Straight out from the ashes. You you turned that experience into an opportunity uh, for growth for yourself. And in a way, you you kind of uh, channeled or, or... as Ali and Justin like to say, transmuted that yeah. uh, low vibrational <laughs> energy into something that is healing not just for yourself, but for others. And uh, I'd like to ask you in terms of uh, individuals or people that have experience with the phenomena. And, you know, at times it can be a, a very lonely kind of kind of road to, to reflect on and, and to think about. Um, and personally speaking, you know, when I had my first... Uh, experience and you know talking with my my family and my friends about it you know they kind of gave me that side eye it's like wow george might have lost his marbles right yeah they have yeah. so <laughs> you know i, I want to ask you um dr lisa you know in terms of of this kind of stigma or, or this kind of uh unwillingness to to explore and, and to allow a safe space for experiencers to kind of uh talk about what they've been through how can these individuals that don't necessarily have a close network of support system, how, how can they psychologically reconcile, uh, you know, their, their experience, their, their belief, their encounter with um, extraterrestrial contact, interdimensional contact, with the skepticism and the ridicule, unfortunately, that they encounter from others? Okay. That's a really good question. And what I can say is, so when I was 15, fortunately, when I, when I realized it was a real experience, not just a dream, um, I was able to share it with my mother because of being in that spiritual school and learning about things like that. But when I went to college and graduate school and I'm in mainstream scientific academia, University of Chicago, Field Museum of Natural History, like hardcore, And I would tell my cohorts, you know, about my experiences and believing in Sasquatch and mermaids and dragons and all that. And they thought I was absolutely nuts. And (laughs) back in the nineties. So this was still, Mm. you know, all of, all of that was way worse than it is now. We have Mm. massively huge strides. And again, thank you government for finally admitting it. Not that the (laughs) experience that need that, but it's helping the skeptics come around a little bit yeah. more. So I had to hide myself. I had to be really normal and not speak about that to have my mainstream careers of being a biology professor. Then I was in the mortgage industry. I was an interior designer. So it wasn't until I actually moved here to Hawaii that I was able to like strip away all the masks and fully step into my mm. self and start sharing my stories. Oh, I just felt that. Yeah. <laughs> then I started, I, you know, I had, a, I had a lot of fear around it because I really cared about people taking me seriously, you know, sure. But I got to a point where it's like, 
I need to speak my truth. I need to, mm -hmm. I am out there sharing it. I'm going to help other people feel comfortable yeah. sharing their stories and feeling validated. And so before I wrote the book, I was writing blogs and I was getting feedback from people in social media and my email list of like, you know, wow, thank you for being brave to speak out so that I, you know, I don't feel crazy. I feel mm -hmm. so validated. And so I think for people who don't have that kind of community, really seeking out the people like us mm -hmm. that really can, it's safe to talk about it, safe mm -hmm. to share. Normalize it. We're just normalizing it because it's been stigmatized for so long. Yeah. We need to strip away all of that get ridicule, rid of get rid of the stigma and just like embrace it for what it is. Right. Exactly. exactly. Now, yeah. And I just want to ask you a question because you mentioned um, guiding people through the experiences that mm. they've already had and how your experiences have helped you do that. But you even take it a step further and offer for people to have their own experiences through your UFO tours. Can mm. you please talk about that? Yes. Because when I read that, I was like, say word, she does what? Right. Like yeah. I've heard of like, like ghost tours because we live in Florida, right? So we have St. Augustine, you know, not that far away from here. Mm -hmm. And it's known to be the most haunted city in the, in the United States because it's the oldest city in the United States. So I've heard about ghost tours, but please school me in the audience about what a UFO tour is. What can somebody expect and what can somebody potentially gain from that? So, um, you know, when I when I moved here, so I moved from Washington State, um, from Olympia, Washington, where it's cloudy nine months out of the year. <laughs> yeah. I never, I didn't, there, there was no way I could have done the kind of tours that I do until I moved here to Hawaii. But when we got here three years ago, I immediately was like, oh my God, there is massive activity here in the islands and the big island, especially. And I've I never been to Hawaii. You used to live, well, George and you live there. He's been there. I've never been there. So I'm a little jelly right now. I just got to throw that out there. All right, Justin, you know what you got to do for <laughs> Valentine's Day, bro. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, I, um, I got the idea to do a UFO tour five years ago when I was in Sedona, Arizona. Oh, oh out of all energetic places yeah, in the Sedona. United States, Sedona <laughs> is where the inspiration came from. I don't find that to be a coincidence. <laughs> and they have several different tour operators there that do UFO tours. And so I, we took the kids for spring break and I signed us up for a UFO tour. I yeah. love you're that kind of mom. Thank you so much for existing. <laughs> She's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> And that was the first time that I ever got to use the military night vision goggles, mm. generation military night vision goggles. So I had seen things, you know, my whole life, just with my eyes or my camera, but okay. game changer using these goggles. And tell so, me why. Well, what it what they do is they amplify the amount of light in the sky, and so there's only so much that the visible eye can pick up, you mm -hmm. know, and satellites and all of that. Sure. So, using these goggles you can see every little pinpoint of light whether it's a star a planet or <laughs> it's a satellite or a spacecraft okay yeah. what i on the tours what we do is i train people how to identify all of the known moving objects in the sky first and foremost so the plane tracker app the satellite app right yeah well and it's you don't even have to use the apps you can um, okay Airplanes and helicopters, very predictable behavior. Satellites, very predictable behavior. Right. right. Stars, very predictable. And so when you know what all of those behaviors really are, mm -hmm. then start looking through the goggles. Then you can see stuff that is behaving in a completely different manner that is not in the known kind of quantifiable category. Yeah. That's likes to have <laughs> and so we see some truly amazing stuff every... tell us about a super remarkable one just give me one good example uh, actually okay. dr lisa before you get into that um and I'm, I'm just dying to ask this question do you engage in any types of uh human initiated contact protocols such as ce5 i mean after you school your clients that hey these are prosaic explanations in the sky do you do any sorts of uh transcendental meditational states to call them in so, 
Um, number one, I always do that before I even do a tour myself. Um, because I'm just so connected. I'm just like, Hey guys, come, you know, and they're, they're so happy that I talk about them. They're always there. Oh. But <laughs> I, okay. So at the moment I have two tour options where one is, you know, I, I'm just educating and we're looking through the goggles and that is it. That's for your mainstream more, you know, curious. introductory level kind of thing. Right. Exactly. And then I do have an extended spiritual tour that people can sign up for where I do lead them through a meditative journey with a sound bowl mm. to their galactic family and guides to learn how to call them in, ask them to come in <laughs> get messages from them. And whether wow. it doesn't matter which kind of tour someone signs up for, we do see the activity just because I, I call them in no matter what. Right. <laughs> But the people who, you know, I don't want to force that spiritual experience on people who are not into it. Yeah. And, and it's been really interesting that sometimes, you know, spouses will come and one, you know, the, maybe the wife signed them up for the spiritual tour and the husband, <laughs> what, I have to do a meditative journey. So I'm just like, you just sit there, close your eyes and just enjoy, just relax. Right. <laughs> and so, yeah. So I give people options at this point. I might change that up at some point. Mm -hmm. but so how how is your meditations for initiated contact similar to or different from like the Stephen Greer CE5 so I am not a plagiarist at all and so okay. mm -hmm. I wasn't assume, I wasn't accusing you of being one yeah, yeah. Uh, by the way just for the record <laughs> yeah, I, I, I knew that but okay. I had people um it's interesting because Stephen Greer a lot of people think he created that CE5 category. He did not. No. Um, that category was added on in 1977 by oh. a neurologist, Fermi Zerpa. And he proposed to Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who created the original three categories. They were at an international UFO Congress in Acapulco, Mexico, where um, Fermi was like, hey, you know, you should add on categories four and five. Enrico Fermi? Mm -mm. Fermi Zerpa. Fermi, Fermi Zerpa. Wow, this is such new history to me. I'm sorry, go on. This is so interesting. <laughs> oh, well, and that's why I like sharing it because a lot of people think Dr. Stephen Greer is the be all end all of CE5. And, but people have been doing CE5 since the beginning of spiritual connection, you know, for thousands of years, right? And even mm -hmm. thousands of years. So, it's just rather than passively waiting for an ET civilization to reach out and say hi to us, it is us actively asking for that connection. And what I have come to understand is that really intention is everything. And yes. so it can be any kind of meditative practice that anyone wants to do. Um, there is no right or wrong way as long as the intention is there and you're coming from love and from the heart. Oh, God. That's what we have have been saying for the longest time. Yeah. And and so, it, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, so the journey that I have created, um, you know, I've I created it to um, really I love people having their own experiences. I am very experiential as a teacher and so when someone can go inward and really actually meet a different galactic race in that meditative state and get messages, get gifts and understand where they come from and know whether it's a family or a guide or something like that. Yeah. And then also then know how to call them in, then it becomes more real to them. Absolutely. And that's why my process, I would say, is probably different than Greer's because his is more just, okay, let's call them in. Mm -hmm. now, and I, and I just want to, oh, sorry, just want to plug something for you real quick. Um, if you go to Dr. Lisa Thompson's website, mysticmana.com, on there she has a free guided 20-minute meditation um, in which you're supposed to meet your galactic guides. And she even has a cute little PDF file where there's like reflective journalistic type of questions. So um, thank you for that amazing free yeah, content. <laughs> oh, I, yes. <laughs> yeah. She's like all the things, yes. <laughs> More that people can experience this. And I, I also do private mm -hmm. sessions where we can actually have real discussion rather than just in a group where 
I can get people deep enough to really, really get to meet their galactic people. Oh my God, that would be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I had a question from, I guess, a, a psychological or, or a neuropsych kind of perspective. You know, um, they, they often talk about various brainwave states, such as the, uh, the alpha brainwave state, which is full waking consciousness that we use to navigate our everyday lives. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it, it, I think full REM sleep is, is beta. Yeah. And is it that, is it that, yeah, say again, the beta is full wide awake state. Oh, full wide awake state. And what's, mm -hmm. is a dream state where, so alpha and theta, theta is just before sleep and delta is deep, deeper sleep. Is it in that theta brainwave state, that intermediary state? Is that where you can perceive, or one can perceive, say, what's behind the veil or uh, things uh, that may exist on, in a different type of frequency or, or dimension that's just outside of our typical five senses? And how does that scientifically work? So actually, it starts in the alpha state when we're in that daydream state. Um, so we can start perceiving things with our eyes, like out of our periphery, mm -hmm. if we're a soft gaze kind of focus out in the sky or even in my house like if I'm just kind of gazing I'll see pops of light all the yep. time me too <laughs> <laughs> and so in that soft gaze state and there's a practice that I teach in my book that I learned at my spiritual school um, called the blue grid where you can actually eyes open in that like deeper part of your mind you can start seeing through the dimension into those higher realms and see see other things that are there. Theta state is where you can actually then maybe have conversations with the ET. Mm. Mm. And so that's typically, that's where I try to get people to go in those meditative journeys is in that theta state. Interesting. And, and these conversations yeah. that uh, occur with somebody that is in this uh, particular meditative state or practice, um, I was wondering what your operant definition of, um, uh, what's the word, Allie? Uh, psychic kind of uh, communication. What is that? Uh, telepathy. Telepathy. What's your operant definition of telepathy? Because I've, I've heard various kinds of um, uh, perspectives on it. Like, I always thought telepathy was like a direct kind of, you can hear somebody else's voices in your mind. But I've also heard other perspectives where these beings communicate uh, telepathically through pictures, imagery, emotion. And the yeah, message well. may not necessarily be discernible at that moment, but may occur the realization over a staggered amount of time. Yeah. So telepathy, in my understanding, um, can be all of the different clair senses, right? So it can come as images through words, through just download and knowing. It can come through this, through the feeling and different people have different clear abilities enhanced in a different way. So like for me, I am highly clear cognizance. So clear knowing and clear sentience, clear. <laughs> <laughs> then after that, then audience, the hearing is my next one. And visual is my least of all of them at this point. But so information is going to come differently in these theta states for people and it is all part of telepathy so you know when i had my experience that conscious memory when i was 15 all of the communication that i was having um with my et guide um it was through telepathy when i met my arcturians it was telepathy and okay i have a piggyback question go ahead and finish i'll keep it in my brain yeah so so people experience it differently and okay <laughs> Love that. Now, um, me on, on my personal journey, you know, I've always been an animal lover and advocate. When I was in high school, I studied animal science. When I was in college, I studied pre-vet, you know, <laughs> so I've always had this love and passion and, and feeling of empathy and mm -hmm. advocacy for them. Right. And I started studying animal communication. Um, and the idea behind that is that you use telepathic means to communicate with animals. So do you also do the same thing? Where does the lines blur between communicating with ETs and NHIs versus communicating with plants, animals, and or landscapes? 
So actually, one of the ways to really enhance the t telepathy is to practice with animals and plants and crystals. Yes, and yes, yes. <laughs> so that's part of what I teach um, in my Connection to the Cosmos book. I just led a galactic retreat where we were doing that. I had people, um, you know, we had, I gave them a bag of crystals, mm. um, different kinds of crystals, and they were to tune in to what that crystal wanted them to know and they got real messages and, and the crystals had names that they gave to them and so everything has consciousness even yeah. inanimate objects actually have consciousness and so you know so you can communicate with anything Mm -hmm. I love that. Thank you for confirming yeah, and validating you. that for I, me. I, I really wanted, appreciate it. I wanted to ask you this, Dr. Lisa, before I forget it. And, um, you know, Ali just asked about uh, telepathy with animals. You, you also mentioned um, that inanimate objects also have consciousness. Now, as a mental health practitioner myself, you know, um, I wanted to ask your opinion about the state of the mental health system, not only here in Hawaii, but across America, where people, um, you know, they go to the, the psychiatrist because perhaps they're encountering uh, visions or seeing things or hearing things. And, you know, they, they see a classically trained psychi psychiatrist or psychologist, and they get diagnosed with either schizophrenia, schizophrenia. or mm -hmm. some type of delusional kind of psychoses and they're put on all kinds of different medications. What do you think of, of, of that traditional way of helping people that have experience with the phenomena? Mm. So in my family, my great grandmother, um, she was diagnosed with schizophrenia. Oh, wow. So this hits home for you then. It does. And okay. we are a lineage of highly gifted, highly connected people. And so back in the 40s and 50s, when she got, you know, diagnosed and hospitalized, you know, they did think she was crazy, but I don't think she was. I got information yeah, a few years ago, basically a download of like, no, she just, she was experiencing. And so what's interesting is that, you know, my, my daughter, she's been on a mental health journey um, since she was very little. And she, you know, she's been to psychiatrists, psychologists, been medicated, and she's highly gifted. And we are trying to navigate. She wanted to do the traditional Western style of drugs first. And now she's realizing like, oh, okay, I guess I am gifted. And maybe there are other methods that I can learn to control my anxiety or my other things like that. Now, what I understand, um, and maybe you have a, a really good explanation for this too, is that, like someone who's truly schizophrenic, the voices or the things that they're seeing really are creating harm for them, as opposed to if you're seeing like ghosts or ETs or other things like that, it's not it's not a harmful thing. How would you all. define harm? Psychological harm, emotional harm? Are they not able to do their activities of daily living, adhere to yeah, a schedule? Where, where they're maybe contemplating suicide or other things like that. Um, you know, really out of control, hurting themselves. Um, you know, that might be a real, you know, mental health. An organic is. kind of predisposition. Right in physiology out of balance chemical imbalance but um so i think that there are you know some re some wiring issues in the brain that can happen but i do think that things get diagnosed um because psychiatrists psychologists that are trained really mainstream they don't understand that these higher dimensional things exist or even lower dimensional things right and, and so they just want to say, you're hearing things, you're seeing things, you're crazy. Yeah, all of this is making me think about, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar, I'm, well, I'm pro you probably are, forgive me. If you're familiar with uh, Dr. Gary Nolan and his work with this and how he says that people that have had experiences 
have a portion of their brain that is more, that has more neural connections and activity versus somebody who's not an experienced. The the basal so, ganglia. There's a higher density yeah, of thank you. neuronal yeah. activity. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. I always forget the name of what the area of the brain is, but <laughs> um, so. I have like a couple of different thoughts with that. So I, I'm wondering if the experience creates the activity, like the extra neurons and that type of thing. And I'm also wondering, like Dr. Lisa just mentioned, if certain people are born with this natural disposition where it's already wired right, and that's why they're having these kinds of experiences. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I think both can be true. That's what I was thinking too, yeah. Either or, but... There, I mean, some people are born just fully turned on, wide awake. Yeah. They tune into all their clear abilities, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they they are experiencers. They just, they're here to be that. And other people are born, like, shut down, <laughs> shut off. <laughs> that pineal gland is calcified. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I don't, it's not one or the other from my perspective. Okay, cool. I have a question that we have not touched on yet, and mm. um, it's 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 been like ruminating in my brain. Can you please school me personally? I don't know if these guys know about it, but what is human design? Can you can you talk on yes. that? Like I've heard it mentioned one or two times, but it's only recently come into my awareness, so I don't know too much about it. Please school me. Yeah, I'm so curious. I want to know also. Actually, um, somewhat of a newer modality. It was only um, okay late 1980s and it was channeled over an eight-day period through a man named Ra Uruhu who what he did was again he's he was kind of out of the way his ego was and it was just channeled okay. where combines astrology the I Ching the Hindu chakra system Kabbalah tree of life genetics and quantum mechanics and it gives you a blueprint <laughs> who you were born to be in this life and energetically how you operate qualities, t you know, talent, skills, abilities, as well as lessons that you're coming in to learn karmically, mm. life focus after that, life purpose, things like that. So, so how do you how do you find out what your design is? Like, do you like take a quiz? Is it a scan that you do? Is it like hypnosis and you're asked and then you, how, do, how do you diagnose or, or come to those terms? Similar to astrology, it uses your birth information. Your oh. Birth mm. Okay. And that's all you need? All you need. Oh, and interesting. The more exact the time is, just like with astrology, the more exact the time is that you know when you were born, the more accurate it is. Okay. There are free programs that will give you a chart. That doesn't mean that you necessarily know how to read the chart. Just same with astrology. I remember the right. first time someone showed me or someone showed me my birth chart. I was like, what is all of this? <laughs> Please translate it for me. Yeah. And so human design practitioners, they have been trained to understand how to read the chart, know what the different things are to help people understand. So are. how does a human design chart differ from a birth chart then? Because I'm having a hard time distinguishing the difference. Okay, well, so one of the, um, the, so again, my mother was an astrologer when I was growing up. up That's until so cool. At roughly age 13, and then we went to that spiritual school. So I grew up with astrology, and for me, you know, it gives, it's amazing. It's very accurate in terms of mm. how, what I'm here to do in the world and how I operate. But human design gave me something a little bit different that astrology didn't give me, which is how I am in flow with the universe in terms of how I'm making my decisions oh. and how energy really works and how it works with other people. Oh. And so for instance, um, I am what's known as a sacral generator. And so- What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> Generator is someone who is meant to wait to respond to something coming their way. That we are not initiators, but we are meant to wait for something to cross our path, whether it's an email invite like George did, or you know, it's maybe a social media post. It's just it can be anything that's external to us. And then with our inner authority, we are able to then get a yes or a no on that thing. Mm -hmm. Now being sacral, that means I have my gut tells me yes or no. And okay. 
43% of the population have that gut answer and it's immediate. Yeah. And so a lot of people, you know, say go with your gut, but all, you know, only 33% really should go with their gut. Other, other people really need to go through some different processing. So there are quite a few different ways to get to the yes and no for other people. Oh. So that's one example. And so when okay. I, I finally knew that, um, I was like, hey, go, 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 you know, hardcore A type, always initiating things, trying to force things. We have so much in common. <laughs> <laughs> You know, when I was trying to force things to happen, life was a lot harder and there was more <laughs> failure, even though there's not, not <laughs> but you know, it, it just was harder. And so when, when I actually 10 years ago learned, okay, I'm supposed to wait to respond. And my coach, she was like, that doesn't mean things aren't going to come. Things will always come to you. Just put yourself out in the world and opportunities will always come your way. And so oh, then wow knowing to trust the gut because I would, I would override my gut and go up to my logical brain. You know, I would override it and think about it. And well, that doesn't make sense. Why is my gut saying yes? I cannot tell you how many times my gut has said one thing and then my rational brain took over and told me another thing and it turned out horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and so for me, when I started following the gut, even if I had if I got a yes on something like major things like divorcing my second husband, um, changing careers again, starting my spiritual business when I had a highly successful interior design staging business and even moving to Hawaii, like major changes. Um, but I, I knew that if I trusted the gut, took the very first step in that direction, then the other steps would start to show themselves. Yeah. I wanted I feel to. Like I need to sign up for this. I wanted to <laughs> ask you, Doctor Lisa, in terms of your intuition and this this um, this ability, this ability of discernment to to trust your instinct. Right. My question is such that if you take that instinct, and you know, um, with all of your knowledge and experience, uh, with your communion with these uh, higher frequency beings. If we extrapolate that to the paradigm shift that's occurring, not only in our country, but around the world where disclosure is becoming more and more of a, of a conversational piece, you know, we have a lot of uh, well-known ufologists who have suggested, and maybe this is part of their, I guess, a fear narrative where they say perhaps something ominous may be happening in the next couple of years, 2026, 2027, Dr. 27. Greer has mentioned it. Um, mm -hmm. Other people have mentioned it that, um, you know, like Ross Coltart, et cetera. Um, yeah, what does seems you... to be this like foreboding yeah, feeling. Yeah, hence, right? hence this seemingly slow drip of disclosure. What does your instinct or gut tell you in relation to these these musings that, that we hear from many different schools of, of ufology? Well, again, fear sells. So um, there are different timelines, different things that people are going to be experiencing, which I mean, it seems so weird to say that when we're all sitting here and kind of watching the world, but um, I don't I don't feel anything ominous whatsoever. In fact, quite opposite in the next couple of years, um, I feel like craft, they're not the super high dimensional ones because it's too hard to densify into earth reality, but there will be more open contact, open communication in a manifest it, manifest it. Yes. And it's not scary at all. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I totally stay away from any of the fear based stuff because I am actually creating my timeline. Oh, I see. So you are a conscious creator. <laughs> that is for sure. So you're, you're manifesting this, uh, this, this optimistic kind of kind of viewpoint. I mean, what do you make of, uh, for instance, David Grush and you know how he testified to to Congress under under oath and just everything going on in the government to try to kind of push the issue to to better and and forward transparency. What do you make of all of this governmental stuff happening? Yeah. Well, again, I mean the the beautiful thing about that happening is that the skeptical people 
are now starting to be like, oh, okay, well, the government's telling me mm-hmm. this, so now I can believe it. Um, mm. yeah. They're like, maybe I should start, start taking this seriously, right? Right, because, I mean, even people like my, my second husband, he was a complete skeptic. Like, I, 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 oh, seven years of fighting, kind of fighting with that. And, but the more that this information comes out, the more that cre- people who are deemed credible because they're in the military or the government, you know, rather than just lay people like us, <laughs> but, the more, you know, people take that seriously, especially the skeptical ones. Mm. And we are going to have more and more disclosure. And it is a good thing. You know, it's about time because we've had eight, nine decades of a disinformation campaign going on. Yep. So really then with the disclosure, it's, it's about, you know, them wanting to say, we need to perceive this as a threat. Yes, it's real. And we need to perceive it as a threat so that they can build more weapons and, you know, Mm. more of their technology to get more money versus those of us that understand, okay, it's not a fear-based thing. Right. And one of the things that, that I understand like really truly for myself is that, and this is true for people and extraterrestrials, anything that's coming into the life, whatever frequency you are resonating at is what can come into your life. Mm -hmm. And so if you are in a high state of vibration, Mm -hmm. people like lower vibe people, they they can't stand to be around you. They will naturally be repelled. It's Mm -hmm. law. And so same thing with the ETs. So, you know, yes, there might be some of the more polarized ETs out there. And those of us that are in that higher state, we're not going to experience them because they naturally just won't be part of our world. Wow. So, okay. So there is... You just blew George's mind. (laughs) So there is this kind of correlation between how individually we can resonate a higher frequency and whatever it is that we put out there we attract and in contrast i'd like to ask you questions about cases for instance in in south america the corrales case in 1977 you know there was this uh peaceful village um you know that you know they just kind of went about their thing um living life and supposedly they were accosted and attacked by ufos and this was a uh, this was confirmed with various government reports it was on the news you know you had pictures of of people with various types of injuries radiation burns there were reports of of these beams these lasers coming through solid objects and irradiating people um, and also cattle mutilations you know the thousands and thousands of cases like what linda moulton howe had dedicated a, a substantive amount of research and time and energy to. What do you make of that? So some of these instances, I I believe are the governments doing it, not the ETs. Yeah. Are you reading my mind right now? Cause like, <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, I'll let you finish. I'm sorry, sorry. I'm just enthusiastic. <laughs> we, we have reverse engineered technology. We definitely have technology that can do things like what you're talking about. And so it's not necessarily an extraterrestrial civilization that is doing it. And some of the really like horrible, um, you know, abductee experiences that people have, it's the government doing that. It's not the ETs. There There are some experiences out there that are kind of whistleblowing that as well. So on such a massive scale over an extended amount of time, like decades of, of this occurring from the government, like, I mean, and that's, that's possible one, one thing. Now, again, there are polarized service to self ET groups as well. And so we have to think about, okay, what, I guess, what, frequency is a group vibrating at. So anything in third, fourth dimensional reality experiences polarity. 
And so just like we as earth humans, we have some earth humans that are kind, compassionate, loving, service to others kind of people. And then we have earth humans that are the complete opposite of that. Mm -hmm. And there are maybe third, fourth dimensional ET groups that have the technology to come here and be here that some of those individuals might be more service to sell, have their own agenda, you know, doing experiments on the cattle or mm. on the people. Um, but it's not across the board. Okay. And so it's not like the entire race, you can't say all humans are bad. And so that's part of that education that I like to do too. You Thank just you. made me think of a question and sorry if I'm cutting anybody off again, but um, I was thinking about a, the lo a lot of the stories of abduction cases to where the experiencers say that they're found in a room and there's like the little grays going around doing the things and then oftentimes off in a corner they see like a mantis being that seems to be like overlooking everything and seems then I'm like okay wait a minute her website is called mystic manta so tell me about that well so the mystic manta part is um manta rays not oh okay <laughs> <laughs> okay Manta rays are my number one spirit animal. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. But the mantis beings, they are some of the most ancient, most wise in our galaxy, maybe even in the universe. They are master healers, master geneticists. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it's the little grays, those are the zetas, that are doing the hybridization program. And the mantis are overseeing that to make sure everything is going okay. That's validating. Thank you. What do you make of those Peruvian mummies that Jaime Musan presented to the Mexican Congress a month ago? They're doing all these DNA tests, and they found that there's reptilian DNA. You know, there's supposedly some controversy where it supposedly was debunked a couple of years ago that it was like a Frankenstein conglomeration of an of a llama head with other types of bones. But you know, subsequently, you know, once they released this information to the Mexican Congress. They've done various types of full body scans and even the director of the hospital in Mexico said, hey, these mummies are all one piece and, and not assembled. What do you make of that? Yeah, actually, um, on Gaia, I watched the entire series of the, the Nazca mummies. Yeah. So I got to see all of the scientific processes that they put these, you know, Maria, the, the larger one, and then the little ones through. And... We have had ET visitors since the beginning of time, and they have lived among us, they have interacted with us. And so, you know, and from my perspective, they're real. Yeah. Even yeah. the Nazca lines are pretty amazing. Like one of the Nazca lines is in the shape of a, you know, yes. these archetypal beings. Oh, right, mm -hmm. yeah, right. And I just got back actually from Peru. I spent two weeks in Peru. Did you? Oh, Machu Picchu, Machu Picchu. It's one of the places we were. We were all through the Sacred Valley, going to you know different um, beautiful ancient alien kind of sites. It yeah. Was tour of Peru. Shout out Graham Hancock. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, you know, one of the things that they also discovered in Peru were the elongated skulls that don't. Yeah. Have little suture like human right. you know they've not bound yes they've found skulls that were bound and run that way but then they have it's, it's that lack of suture that differentiates it mm -hmm. the palate is a little bit different as well and so as a, a former uh, you know comparative anatomy and physiology evolutionary biologist i uh, understanding that anatomy really well it is a completely different species a different race and, you know, the Syrians, the Orions, um, some of those humanoid types have that elongated skull. And so, and they were here actively working with humans. So, so. it makes me, it, it makes me think of this picture that I, or a uh, photograph that I came across that was from NASA. I downloaded it from NASA's JPL website. And it was a photograph of Mars from one of the rovers. And in this photograph, it appears as though there's a broken up statue of 
some type of being that has an elongated skull. And I mean, the, I, I cannot explain why this picture would have been on NASA's JPL website, other than the fact that it really came from the rover. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I don't think they realized it. Like they forgot to scrub that part. I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it, it, it goes to, to say, or it speaks to that, um, whatever civilization existed existed then. back then you know i mean they could have been on mars a long long time ago yes and they were and they were also on maldek which was the mm. between mars and jupiter which is now our asteroid belt oh okay the kuiper so, belt is that what it's called i, I believe so oh. i just know it's the asteroids between mars and jupiter that's what sure. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's actually where Bigfoot originated from as mm. well. Mm. And so when the human types that had colonized from Orion, they so the Orions, they colonized Maldek, and they were still warring with each other because Orion was highly polarized um, mm. based on the Orion Wars. And so they just... Soft disclosure movies, right? <laughs> Star Trek too. Yep. Yeah. And mm. so... Um, Basically, Bigfoot being interdimensional needed to relocate when its home planet was destroyed. So they were able to shift here to Earth. Mm. Um, you know, when Mars basically ended up going the way that Earth timeline, some timeline potentials for Earth are going, they needed a new home as well. Okay. The civilization on Mars, was it called uh, Cydonia or something? Uh, uh, That's a location. Location? Okay. That's a location on Mars where they found or they, uh, what was it? It was a satellite that was orbiting Mars, took a picture and it looked like there was a face on the surface of the planet. Oh, you know, that was oh. Sidonia. I'm glad you right. knew that because oh. I didn't. <laughs> right, and there's other there's other interesting structures in Sidonia. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a pyramid and then what looks like to be a, um, a pentagon shaped type of building and some other stuff. Yeah. But that's Sidonia. Well, and then Very Venus. Cool. We have beings living inside of Venus as well. Mm, mm. Even if it's the hottest planet in the atmosphere, they have a runaway greenhouse effect. In so, yeah. Okay, you can live inside planetary bodies and not be affected by surface temperatures or weather. Mm. And in fact, the where I was taken when I was 15 was inside. Yeah, that's what I want to know. The moon Io, Jupiter's moon of Io, which that's the least likely place that any scientist would ever think there would be life because it's the most highly volcanic of any planetary body in our solar system so mm. this is extremely toxic but the group they had colonized inside of the moon where the atmosphere was very controllable mm. it's, it's a very common thing in our solar system and then also on other planets is living inside just like we do have inner earth living here I was literally yeah. just brewing that question because I, I remember reading that it's you've had contact with I think thirteen different races, and my question was, I wonder if any of them were inner Earth races. Mm. Yeah. Oh, uh, really? So the Agarthans are the inner Earth beings who they are like fourth, fifth dimensional reality. We can't necessarily see them unless we raise our vibration or they densify enough. Mm. To and so Ascendant Master St. Germain, he, he is said to live inside of Talos, the city inside of Mount Shasta. That's one of the major inner Earth cities. I know quite a few people who have actually met him when they go to Mount Shasta, like physically. Wow. Him. So he's one who appears to people regularly and communicates. But we have, you know, different cities throughout Earth, inside of Earth. And these people, they originated from when Lemuria and Atlantis, Atlantis were failing as civilizations, basically were being destroyed. Some of those people went, went underground. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We also have reptilians underground too, different types and not the bad ones. I mean, maybe there are some of the polarized ones, but some that are more highly evolved as well. So we have different groups, but the Agarthans tend to look very human because they were human. So we're talking about different races of aliens, right? Mm -hmm. We've mentioned um, Bigfoot. 
we've mentioned spirits and this is something that's always made me so curious i don't okay so like we have the the aliens we have the spirits we have the interdimensionals i'm wondering are these all separate categories or are they all somehow blended and in the same grouping like wh what do you think about that ultimately we are all connected and we are all every energy yeah we're all <laughs> yeah. energy right so what's the different categories so we like to categorize things as humans as humans we like labels right <laughs> Yes, and I think that there are legitimate reasons to categorize things into different kinds of things to for us to wrap our minds around it. Okay. Um, but, you know, some of the ET groups, they're experienced as angels. So someone like you who comes from that Catholic background is going to perceive it as an angel. Someone like me who is a full-on ET believer is going to experience it as an ET. That's and what I'm asking about, yeah maybe the same thing right mm -hmm. yeah <clears throat> okay I'm so i want to know what the that. inside of this uh ship was like oh the one yeah. that took you to io okay so <laughs> it was a smaller shuttle craft so it's just me and my et guide okay. and what um being inside of the craft from that perspective the walls look completely transparent like you could fully see out into space Mm. And so, so you, so I just remember seeing, you know, the darkness, the pinpoints of the light as we're even the floor. Well, I wasn't looking down. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just thinking of like a glass bottom boat and like seeing the dolphins swim <laughs> underneath it. So I'm like, I wonder if the ship was the same way. I was looking out, you know, I, okay. so I was sitting on a surface um, of something, but I was more just mesmerized with flying through the space because especially going through the different gas layers and the beautiful colors mm. and mm. the newer photos that have come back from the James Webb telescope of the nebula and how gorgeous those colors are mm -hmm. flying through that. I mean, it was just, just, <laughs> I get excited just going through the freaking car wash where you get the <laughs> blue and the pink things right on the car. I'm like, Oh, it looks like, but yeah. I can't imagine having that type yeah, of experience. Yeah, that would be amazing. Wow. So <laughs> when you were on that ship and you were with your galactic guide, was that when you uncovered the fact that you have been experiencing them since you were a child? Since you were a child, like was that when your memories were unlocked, or when did your memories from childhood become? <laughs> so, well, okay. So when he picked me up, um, he looked very human, and so and I felt like I knew him. Like I I had no fear whatsoever, and it was like a friend. Okay. And, uh, you know, as he was touring me around the facility, I wasn't being examined on that trip. He was just basically giving me a tour and telling me I was getting to ask all the questions. Now, this is already at IO on yes. the underground facility. Correct. Okay. And so what it looked like was like a hospital type of facility where mm. I could go to the different rooms. There were people, I, everyone looked very human. And so... People were being examined, nothing scary, no probes or anything. But my question to him when I saw everyone looking so human was like, are you human? Everyone here looks human. And he said, no, those of you that we brought there are human. We are humanoid, but we disguise ourselves because our form scares you. Mm. So they basically put on like some kind of cloaking mask as to not set off your fight or flight response, right? Exactly. And so at the end of the tour, because well, and my question, my next question to him was, well, why are we, why did we get brought here? Why am I here specifically? Okay. And he said that um, those of us that have been chosen to be taken there were being tested to see if something happened to Earth, if we could live in an environment like that or something similar. And this was oh. in 1988, where we were still in the Cold War, on the verge of World War Three. Sure. So there was a timeline where something like that could have happened. Sure. Mm. Then at the end of the tour, um, I asked him if I could see what he really looked like. Because That's what I would have done. I'd have been like, take the mask off. Show yeah, me your true form. Yeah, we want to see what you look like. <laughs> like you, Allie, I was obsessed with that. <laughs> and the yes. weirder, the better. <laughs> right? The weirder they look, the more interested I am. I'm always in. Yeah. Did it, so did, did it reveal its that. true form? What did it look like? <laughs> um, it ended up, he was about seven feet tall. He had pure white skin, like really chalky white skin. 
big dark eyes and long red hair, like super red, like your mushroom red. Okay. Oh, wow. He had uh, triads tattooed on his cheeks. Now, are there any illustrations of this um, anywhere? There are no? not. Okay. So what I, so what I have done, you know, there are different people that have written different like extraterrestrial species almanacs. Okay. And I looked for this group, um, just trying to figure out like, who are they? Does anyone else know who they are? And so, okay, so the story, how I, how I got to realize that it was a real experience. When I came back from it, I thought, okay, that's the weirdest dream I've ever had. But I, mm -hmm. I never forget the details with dreams. You don't, within 10 minutes, you forget details. Yeah, as soon as I wake up, it starts slipping away. The more you try to like grab onto it to remember mm -hmm. it, the more it's like, no. <laughs> um, my mother, when I told her, when I finally realized that it was a real experience, um, and it, it was actually reading the book Communion, Whitley Strieber's book yes. Communion. Where, Shout out Whitley. Good book. <laughs> at the end of the book, he's interviewing different people that had had similar experiences, had been taken. And everyone has the same kind of gray experience as him, except for one guy had a completely different story where he was telling Whitley he was taken to a moon of Jupiter and told he was one of the chosen ones. That and sounds familiar. Whitley made a little side comment kind of sarcastically saying, I hope it isn't Io. <laughs> and when I read that, head to toe chills, tears. <laughs> Instant confirmation. It was validation. It was. And so then I went and told my mom, knowing she would believe me. And then a few days later is when she introduced me to one of the other students at our spiritual school, the guy that had been formerly very high government, who knows about the different AT races that our government works with and knows about. Oh. So when I described what they looked like to him when I got to that part, he was like, he's like, I don't know that race. He said, but we don't know all of them. There are so many out there. But he said, you had a real experience. Wow. 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 I, from from the scientific aspect, you know, a lot of people at uh, UAP Society, you know, we got some hardcore scientists and physicists there, and they mm -hmm. always speculate, how do these things operate? What What's the what's the power source? Is it tapping into some kind of zero point energy field? Do they warp space and time? Do they are, are these interdimensional displacement craft? Were I you able to glean any of that science from them? Um, no, but I wasn't interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I wasn't there for that. Yeah, no. no. I wasn't there for that. Um, but I know different groups have different technologies that they use. And yes, all everything that you just said, you know, people are, the groups are utilizing different means of being able to travel very quickly. And so um, to answer the question about how I found out. I oh, yeah, I forgot I asked that. I, Sorry. A couple of <laughs> I was working with a psychic medium um, and I was trying to, because I was starting to write my book, I wanted to get more details, more information about like, okay, why have I not like run across these people? No one's ever described them. No one's ever illustrated them. And I haven't ever attempted to because I can draw animals, but I'm not good at drawing people. But I, people have asked me to, so I might just try to do that. But um, what the information that was coming through and it was actually being channeled was that they are not part of any of the galactic federations. They very oh. rarely interact with Earth, but they are affiliated with the Arcturians. Mm. Oh. And I have such that strong connection with the Arcturians, but the Arcturians are in a much higher dimension and these guys are closer to our earth reality. And okay. so like they were kind of my protectors for the for the Arcturians. Okay. Every time I hear of the Arcturians, I always think of Daniel Scranton. And I know that you interviewed with him and I love that. I've been following <laughs> him for I think like two or three years now. Um, I, I also had a session with him where I signed up and he channeled the Arcturian Council for me and they answered some questions that I had at that time and it was a very interesting experience. Yes. Yeah, I love Daniel's work. He's yeah, so do I. Shout out Danny. <laughs> <laughs> He's actually in the session um, that I ended up doing with him. Like I, I hired him 
And he didn't pull forth the Arcturians. He pulled forth the 12th dimensional creators, which is one of them. And so it was in that session that I got the information or confirming because I had suspicion that I was part of the hybrid program. And Mm -hmm. I got confirmation that I was and that I have 12 hybrid Zeta hybrid children. Oh, oh wow. wow! Okay, Jinx. Jinx. <laughs> <laughs> were you able? Were you first. able to meet your children, your hybrid children? Not consciously yet, but it's coming. Oh. Yeah, but I do know people that have been able to meet their hybrid children, and um, they've been on my podcast, and a couple of them are really good friends of mine. And, wow. Yeah. I would love to speak with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Dr. Yeah. Lisa, I, I noticed in your background you have a, a beautiful painting of uh, Shakyamuni Buddha, right? Um, I, I wanted to ask you, um, in terms of, of Buddhism, you know, they believe that life is suffering. There's four noble truths. Um, life is suffering. Uh, it's due to attachment, um, etc. cetera. Um, And there's this wheel of samsara, uh, birth and death, based off of uh, the time that, you know, we expire in this this physical form, that your uh, state of mind or or your your propensity to uh, attach to certain things will determine your next rebirth. Um, And that also, in this cycle of birth and death, there are also other dimensions with other types of uh, beings, like the hungry ghosts, Um, And there's also a God realm. How do you fit or how do you reconcile uh, this tradition and belief of Buddhism with uh, your esoteric knowledge of of the phenomena? So for me, I would say I am not a Buddhist, um, but there are parts of that reincarnation idea, the the birth, death, recycling kind of thing that I fully embrace. And um, I, I spent a couple of weeks in Thailand where, you know, 95% of the country are Buddhists. And it was one of my most favorite places on earth in terms of the people, the way that they operate with each other. It's just such beauty. Aww. I mean, even the chaotic traffic in Bangkok you know, it's like this chaotic ballet of cars moving and it's just <laughs> crazy because, you know, that could never happen here in the States um, mm. of that. So there are, you know, elements of each of the world's religions that really are true. And so I just happen to love the, the Buddhist aesthetic um, and, but suffering you know, I do not feel like we have to suffer. Oftentimes, Earth Earth school is really hard, and so we do. <laughs> Earth school. I like that term. Yes. Yes. Shout out Dolores Cannon. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but some people, and just and Dolores has found this in her work, is that some people get to come and basically have a really easy resting life, while the rest of us are like, "What kind of lessons can I learn?" What am I going to achieve? What wisdom do I want to gain? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the suffering piece, that's part of that earth experience because in that kind of polarized, good, bad, push, pull, that's where evolution, it's a mechanism of evolution. That's mm-hmm. spiritual evolution. Are we talking biological evolution, everything in between? spiritual evolution and ultimately that does change our biology Mm. hey speaking of biology um i want to bring up the the notion of junk dna right like scientists say that we have a lot of junk dna it's there but it doesn't do anything it just you know they're not sure what its uh function was 90 percent of it supposedly some astronomically high number yeah right right so what are your thoughts on junk dna and then I'll, I'll assume I know what you might say and follow up with how do we activate it and unlock the gifts that come with that? Okay, so yes, <laughs> there, um, in biology, nothing exists without a purpose. Right. 
Unless it's something that used to be functional, like the appendix, right? Where, okay. and at some point in our evolution, that won't even exist in the human body because it's non-functional. So, um, in, so we have, I'll first say this, we have up to 22 different ET races in our DNA. 22. Two. Now there are, some people say 13, some people say 22. Okay. I can't give an exact number, so I always say up to. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Up to and including 22. <laughs> and so we have had different ET visitors throughout Earth's history coming and genetically modifying the human body, tweaking it, adjusting it. And um, and I do, I had an experience of having a life as one of these genetic engineers. At, wow. As a genetic engineer doing this. Really? For ancient time of Egypt during the building of the pyramids, like way, 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 way longer Color ago. Color me fascinated. Awesome. So there is no junk DNA. It's just latent DNA from our ET ancestors <laughs> that as we are evolving as a consciousness, as we are awakening, as Mother Gaia is shifting into this fifth, fifth dimensional reality, it's naturally activating that DNA to turn on. And so when they sequenced the human genome, they found places where instead of it being smooth and natural, there were kinks and yeah. a, like genetically modified plants. Yeah, the markers didn't make sense, right? right. And yeah. So um, so there's proof that, or evidence that way. And then we have the missing links in human evolution, just like we have missing links in other animals as well. But we have like almost overnight massive shifts in anatomy and physiology. And so these are the places where this genetic modification was happening in my understanding. Gotcha. Interesting. So how do we activate it? If it, I know, yeah. I know you said that we can activate it just through the natural course of Earth ascending herself. But are there things and tools that we could use to to help that process to speed it up as a catalyst? Actually, the higher vibration that we're operating in regularly, that mm -hmm. is already naturally activating that DNA. Okay. Um, there are d different processes that um, there's one session that I led earlier this year, which actually was channeled through the mantis. The mantis came through me to activate the 12 strand DNA. For oh, wow. And so that's a, a meditation journey that I offer on my website. It's like $33 to watch the replay on that class. Okay, we're going to have to sign up for that one because yeah, I am obsessed sure. <laughs> with mantids. I, I had no clue that that's what they were going to do, but you know, again, they are master geneticists. And so that's what they brought through. And so the more that one is really trying to activate that consciously activating it, it's going to happen. And that's where our skills of telepathy, which are naturally there, all of our clear abilities really come online even stronger. Our body has the amazing ability to heal itself. Mm hmm. So that's where what those superpowers are that are really naturally a part of us. That's what activating that DNA does. Wow. Thank you for answering that so eloquently. I love that. Yeah, that was a good answer. <laughs> Great answer. And yeah. Dr. Lisa, I want to honor your time. My last question um, for you. What do you make of these entrepreneurs such as Elon Musk or these AI scientists who are developing these these technologies, these algorithms? For instance, uh, with Elon Musk, he wants to augment the brain with technology through a direct implant with Neuralink. Mm. What what do you think of that? In terms mm. of this this transhuman kind of direction yeah. that we may be going through. But again, yeah, that. Um... For me, that is an area that I do not want to be a part of. Why is Tell that? Tell us why. Because, okay, so as that life of the Syrian that I got to experience, when things happen in their own natural evolution, it's so much more harmonious and in flow with the universe mm. as opposed to trying to force something to happen or initiate something to happen. Now, again, 
you know, there, there is no good or bad because it's just all an experience that our soul comes here to, to live out. And so even if we are forced to go that way as a civilization, that doesn't make it bad, right? It's just another roller coaster ride experience that we have here on the amusement park of earth. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so my Lisa's ego wants to stay away from it, but ultimately it, it is what it is. It's that looking at it from the human perspective thing versus zooming out and looking at it from the cosmic conscious perspective thing, right? Yes. <laughs> Very yeah. good question. And we also want to honor your time. So, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I just got to say, I'm in, like, yeah. I'm so impressed with you. I, I feel like <laughs> everything you're saying is resonating. You're so smart. We have so much in common. I love that you studied animal biology as well. That was something I did too. I just feel like we're vibing right now. I love it. I could talk to you for like 10 more hours, but I, you know, we got to get going. So um, why don't you ask your famous question and we'll close with that. Okay. Um, yeah. So this is a pretty deep one, um, but what is your greatest hope for the future of humanity on this planet? That we ultimately really do shift into the fifth dimensional reality as a collective where there's no more polarization, no more judgment. Mm. Everyone understands that we are all connected and love and unity really yes. the thing. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yes, great answer. That's Thank such you an so much. uplifting message, Dr. Lisa. Yeah. I have enjoyed this conversation yeah, me thoroughly. Too. <laughs> <laughs> so have I. Thank you. Thank you for <laughs> your aloha lovely. warmest mahalos, Dr. Lisa. And uh, if you can tell our, our viewers and listeners where we can find you again. And what else you may have coming up that they should mm -hmm. sign up for. Yeah. So, um, you can find me at mysticmanta.com or bigislandufotours.com. I'm also on Facebook, um, on YouTube, Connection to the Cosmos with Dr. Lisa Thompson. I just this week had my newest book come out on Amazon. Okay, tell us about it. That's called Wisdom of the Galactics, Channeled Messages to Elevate Your Life. And mm. so this is... Um, the sessions that I led earlier this year, the 13 different galactic races that I channeled, that's what this book is about. It's actually the written out um, channelings of these groups, who they are, so that people can really start getting to know that they don't have to be afraid of some and of these. Didn't you also make an Oracle card deck under the same title? Tell me about that. So I, um, in addition to writing multiple books, I also, I love design and creating things. So I've created nine Oracle decks. Tell us, tell us. So I have the Wisdom of the Galactics Oracle deck. I also have the Connection to the Cosmos deck, which relates to last year's book that I wrote. But mm. then I like this, Allie, because I have Sacred Soul Animals, Sacred Soul Marine Animals, Sacred Soul <laughs> Birds, Sacred Soul <laughs> Flowers. And frequency of the colors, and then mm. full love. Wow. wow. I'm here for all of that. <laughs> I'm here for all of that. Oh, and I have the Aloha Spirit deck, too. Uh Ooh. Okay. George, it'll be your first one, then. I'll check that yeah. out. And and links will be uh, included in the description. And mm -hmm. once yes. again, Dr. Lisa, you know, from the bottom of our hearts, and, you know, we're just so honored and, and humbled to to learn from you and, and your perspective and everything that you're doing to forward uh, <laughs> disclosure and, and, and reduce the stigma and, and help people with true aloha. You know, I, I respect that so much. And again, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. It means a lot. What he said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so yeah. much. This was an amazing conversation and I hope that we can talk to you again. Yeah. Very cool. Take care, everybody. Aloha. All right. Okay. Bye, guys. Don't forget to hit like. Don't forget to hit subscribe. Don't and forget share to... it. <laughs> and, and don't forget it. to hit the notification bell. Share it with all your friends. Yeah. And definitely check out Dr. Lisa's websites, her Facebook, her YouTube, and uh, get yourself an Oracle deck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or a book. <laughs> or a meditation. Or any of the other things. And a consultation. <laughs> there yes. you go. Yes. <laughs>
Okay, much love, everybody. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> Aloha. Aloha. Namaste.